Hello, good afternoon and welcome to, or good morning, wherever you are. <laughs> welcome to the Mathematics for Public Health Next Generation Seminar. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional lands of, uh, on which the Fields Institute is operating. And for thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat and the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Dr. Jimmy David, who is the lead of the Mathematics for Public Health Next Generation group, and she will introduce our speaker today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sarah Nayani. Um, we appreciate your help. So today I'd like to welcome everyone to fresh start of the new year, 2022. And I know this year will be better for everyone. Uh, well, it may not really look like it <laughs> based on the, what, uh, what we hear in the news, but let us be hopeful because uh, it will be a better year for everyone. So today we have uh, Dr. Elisha Are, who will be presenting on COVID and gain. Dr. Are is a postdoctoral fellow in mathematics, uh, in the mathematics department at uh, Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, and a research associate at the South African Center for Epidemiological Modeling and Analysis, which is popularly known as SASIMAR. He currently works with uh, Professor, is currently working with Professor Caroline Collin on several um, modeling projects, focusing especially on modeling for public health policy to inform COVID-19 response plans in Canada. And he holds a PhD in mathematical uh, biology from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. It will present uh, their work on COVID-19 endgame from pandemic to endemic. So you're welcome to present. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Dr. David. Uh, it's a privilege to, to be here to present. I will share my screen now. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So earlier on in the, uh, during the pandemic, it's not uncommon for us to hear people say, uh, COVID is just going to die out or it's going to disappear like uh, previous SARS viruses. But as time goes on, it is becoming clearer that rather than being eliminated or eradicated, COVID is more likely to become endemic. So the question around the transition from, from pandemic to, to endemic mode, it's very important. Um, it will be, I will be presenting some of the results uh, we, we got from the work we did where, where we explored the path of COVID-19 transition from pandemic to, to endemic mode. So you may be wondering why we are talking about endemicity now, uh, that is it not ironic that we have um, Omicron COVID um, variant surging in almost everywhere in the world, and we, we are talking about endemicity. Well, at the end of this talk, you will see why it is important for us to to keep this as an ongoing discussion as we, we go on in the, uh, in the pandemic. So to just for the sake of definition, uh, endemic uh, in layman's term uh, just means at the time where or when we will be able to live with COVID-19 without having to shut down or Im implement, implement um, significant public health uh, measures to stop resurgence in cases. So it's just a point where we, we are fine to live with it, although we, we still have cases. We'll still have cases, but we are happy to live. Uh, we can live with it. So and reopening in, in my presentation means relaxation of public health uh, measures. So just please keep those uh, definitions in mind as we proceed. So despite the widespread use of vaccine and va high, very high vaccine uptakes in some parts of the world, COVID is, is still spreading. So even before Omicron, COVID was still spreading rapidly in, in many countries. 
so far a total of 293 million cases, um, 5.45 million deaths uh, due to COVID have, have been reported globally. And despite this widespread use of vaccines, we still fall back to using MP MPIs, that is non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions like mask mandates, physical or social distancing measures to curb resurgence in cases. Yeah, in British Columbia, where I'm based, and whose data we are using for as a case study, uh, they have recorded a total of 255,000 cases and 2.4 thousand deaths uh, for, for, for due to COVID from the beginning of the pandemic. So it is also keep in mind that these reported case numbers are, are much should be much less than the actual case numbers because we know that cases are under mostly underreported. So we ask uh, some important questions. We know that. NPI measures are effective. And when we shut down, most times we often get cases down to uh, bearable levels. But we know that the effect of, of lockdowns or restrictions are unpalatable, and they often take their toll on, on the mental health of individuals and also uh, economic, they also impact the economy negatively. So we, we always have to find a way to lift restrictions without risking a resurgence of cases. And that's the key thing, uh, the key goal uh, for, for many countries. So we ask some important questions and some of the questions that, that I put here, uh, how does gradual reopening compare with rapid reopening in terms of uh, case numbers and hospitalizations? So gradual reopening means when we decide to lift public health restrictions, we do that in phases, rather than lifting many measures at the same time. So where, where, where uh, gradual reopening means, well, sorry, rapid reopening means we open at once, we lift many things at once, while gradual reopening means we do that in phases over a long period of time. So we also asked uh, the question that, how do we transition from pandemic to endemic mode with minimal cases? And like I said, we used British Columbia as, as a case study uh, the population, about 80% of the population are now fully vaccinated. So it's, the, it's a relatively high uh, vaccinated population. We are not saying British, British Columbia is representative of all highly vaccinated population, but we use this as a basis for comparison. So we also considered uh, the factors that would determine incidence as at endemicity and what the implication of viral evolution would be and vaccination coverage levels. And we used uh, some modeling approaches to answer these questions. So the first modeling uh, framework that we used uh, was an age and contact structured model. And afterwards we explored a simpler susceptible, vaccinated, exposed, infectious, recovered uh, uh, model that is often called SVEIRS model. The S means that waning happens, people go back to being susceptible. So I will get into the details for each model as I will proceed in the talk. So now the age and contact structured model. So I will give you a very a high level description of the model. Um, you can consult Mulberry et al. 2021 for a detailed description of the, of the model. So the, some of the key assumption that went into the model because we adapted the, the modeling framework from, from that paper. So some of the, um, the key assumptions are the model is stratified by age and by being either essential worker or not. So it's stratified by age and, and contact. The model also consists a, a contact matrix that represents the contact probability between different age groups and also essential uh, worker groups. So the term essential worker so will mean people who have, to, who have to go to work and most times they have higher contacts with people because of the, the kind of work they do. 
So here, the reproduction number are kind of models the effectiveness of, of different interventions that we used. So the schematic uh, for the, the model is here. So we have people being susceptible, they, they are in S, everybody starts in S. And if they have, you are vaccinated, you either, either go to V or you go to S, so subscript S, X. So if the model is, uh, if the vaccination is effective in protecting you from infection, you go to V. If it's not, then you go to S, uh, subscript so X. So the lambda there is the, the force of infection and it takes account of the contact structure. So the vaccination rate is alpha and vaccination happens at, at a rate each day. <clears throat> So new subscript E is um, models protection against infection, while new subscript P models uh, protection against uh, disease or symptoms. So essentially, if you if one is not protected by vaccination, then the, the I don't know if you can see my my the arrow, but the down uh, path there, uh, the the ones with subscript X, you you can proceed there until when someone dies or, or recover from the disease. Whereas when one is protected, the person stays protected. So this particular model does not, uh, does not include waning uh, of, of immunity. So, and yeah, that's just kind of the uh, brief summary of the key assumptions that we, that are embedded in the, that are embedded in the model. So to validate the model, we simulate and we compare this, the, the output to actual case counts uh, by age. So what you are seeing there is the incident, uh, incident cases over time uh, by each age group and each age group is, is color coded and different age groups are also there from zero to nine to age 80 plus. <clears throat> So like I said, the black dots are the data and you can see that the, the model kind of match the data in, uh, to a reasonable extent. So after validating the model, we now looked at some, ask, uh, some specific questions. So we compare gradual reopening versus uh, rapid reopening. So, and uh, this, is a, this is a, one of the results that we got. So the, or is it the vertical axis is the reported cases per 100K of the population per day. And the black dots A are the actual reported cases, total reported cases over time. We also control here for underreporting. So the vertical line, the dotted vertical line there showed the time that we reopen to when we start lifting um, public health uh, measures. And we, we assume that it will be maybe around somewhere in December. So keep in mind that although we did not model exclusively Omicron here, we can look at reopening, we can compare the reopening to when a high transmission uh, variant enters into the population and is highly transmissible, essentially increases R. Because here, what we do is we are increasing R from that time on, assuming that reopening leads to increase in the reproduction number. So it is clear here that rapid reopening will lead to higher peak compared to gradual reopening. And, and, and also we looked at hospitalizations and um, for both uh, cases. So uh, gradual reopening will, will always uh, lead to lower cases when you compare it to opening uh, all at once. So this is uh, a very important thing uh, to, to keep in mind. Also, we now considered what I would call a counterfactual BC scenario, where we assumed that a, a population that is similar to that of British Columbia uh, has 70% vaccine um, coverage and they reopen on or versus when they have 90% vaccination coverage and they reopen. So we want to look at the effect of vaccination coverage in, in that kind of settings. So, and what we see here is that when 70, only 70% of the population uh, is vaccinated, you will have 
a higher uh, resurgence, the rebound will be higher, the peak will be higher, and the total number of cases will be much higher than when we have 90% vaccination coverage. Uh, Martin, I can see your hand up. Uh, yeah, very quickly. Is that rapid reopening or gradual? So the gradual reopening, uh, okay, for this case, we are looking at rapid reopening. So that's with the vaccination, these vaccination levels and rapid reopening. Yeah. I'm just curious as to what it would look like with these vaccination levels and gradual. You see what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. I get what you mean. And it's the, the thing is that whenever you we look at whatever doesn't matter the, the vaccination level coverage, when we compare lower reopening, to, uh, sorry, rapid reopening to to gradual reopening, gradual reopening will always lead to lower case counts uh, compared to rapid reopening. And we explored this in the uh, in the preprints, in the supplementary material of the preprints. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and that also applies for hospitalization too. When we lower vaccination coverage, uh, will lead to higher hospitalization compared to when you have higher uh, vaccination coverage. So, after doing this, what we now did was to calculate the herd immunity threshold from the H and contact structured model. So, and we now compared it to herd immunity threshold that we calculated from a simple SIR model. So herd immunity uh, uh, means immunity, the um, herd immunity threshold I would define as immunity that would be sufficient to, to keep cases under control where you have enough immunity in the population that cases cannot spike. So that's, so the, the, the threshold is what we explored here and we now compare the two. And what you will see here is that despite the fact that the other model is much more complex, much more detailed, the simpler models um, are the immunity calculation kind of matched very closely what we got there. So that's motivated us to I'll see that, okay, let us use a simpler model that will be more tractable to explore further questions. And that's what we did. So we now look, used also a, uh, a simple SVEIR model, uh, but for this one, this one does not have H, H structure, does not have contact structure. We assume homogeneous mixing and all the regular assumptions that goes with, um, uh, is a, a, a classical SEIR model. So <clears throat> this is much simpler and we now allow immunity to win. So vaccine, vac so if you look at the schematic diagram there, when you, uh, once one is exposed to become infectious, then you recover or die, then you, when you recover, then immunity wins after some times. Also, if you are vaccinated, after some time, immunity wins, you go back to, to being susceptible. So it's a simple model uh, which we allow for importation. So because it's simple, it's easier for us to solve it analytically to get um, closed form solution for, for the states at equilibrium points. Uh, and that's what we did. So like I said, I, just, I will just mention some of the key model assumptions there, the, uh, the parameters, uh, are quite intuitive. The uh, mu is the background uh, mortality. Sorry, the, yeah, the mu is the background mortality. Sigma is the rate uh, at which exposed people, people become infectious. Uh, gamma is the recovery rate. And the winning rate is uh, uh, omega. So some of the things you should keep in mind is that for this model, we assume that winning uh, happens at the same rate for vaccinated people and uh, and um, those who recover the, uh, from from infection. So we, of course, the, when you go into the details, some of these things may may differ, but for simplicity, we assume that we are the same. That they are the same. So CT here kind of models the the intervention. So we defined it. <clears throat> so when you any implement any public health measures that are implemented. Uh, in the population are modeled uh, using a CT and N is the total population. So this is just the framework of the simpler model that we used. And these are some of the, 
sorry. Yeah, these are some of the results that we got. So we looked at different path uh, to endemicity. So we assumed that, okay, if we reopen sometimes in, in, in December, and we re now reopen to different R, R not values. So when, of course, when you reopen, contact rate increases, people start mixing more, and you, you expect the reproduction about to, to also increase. And that's what we captured here. So you, you will see that if we reopen to the level in which the reproduction number is, is about five, then you will see this huge uh, spike in cases that, that declines gradually over time. But if we reopen, maybe we don't actually reopen completely. Uh, we reopen in a reasonable way where the reproduction number is about R, then you have this very little uh, rebounding cases, then it stabilizes with time. So there are a lot of caveats embedded here that, that some of the things I would let, like to mention uh, is that we are assuming that the immunity lasts longer, maybe about more than two years here in the, that, in the first simulation here, uh, the first figure there, immunity lasts for more than, more than two years. And we also assume that reporting uh, the rate of reporting is also constant over time. This will change depending on, on what the uh, public direction that the public uh, policymakers are taking. So the second graph uh, there, we looked at the impact of uh, duration of immunity. So if R0, if you reopen when R0 is 3.5, then if immunity wins after one year, you can see that you have a rebound there in, in cases, whereas if the if immunity lasts longer for about three years, then you, cases can stabilize. Please also keep in mind that we assume that boosters happen here. So with the model parameter, the, model, the parameter values that we used here, assume that every uh, six months or so, every one also get revaccinated. So it's continuous, uh, people are continuously boosted. Immunity is continuously boosted. So of course, in real life, it may not be entirely true, but we are just looking at a scenario where this is true and projecting what will happen uh, before cases become stable. So another phenomena that we, we explored here is what we, we choose to call antigenic drift and shift. And this term we borrowed from, from influenza. So some influenza viruses uh, experience what, what we call antigenic drift, and some experience uh, what we call antigenic drift, uh, a shift. So an antigenic uh, drift means gradual changes um, or gradual mutations, small, small mutations that the, the, there won't be a major change in the, in the virus. So the, the, immune, the, immune, the immune system will still be able to pick up uh, when the virus comes in and they will be able to respond to it effectively because the virus is changing, mutating gradually over time. Whereas antigenic uh, shift is the complete opposite of that. Whereas where the virus mutates, uh, experiences large mutation over a very short period of time where the body uh, the antibodies um, in the body will not be able to, to, to recognize the virus within a short time. And how, we, how did we model this? We model this by looking at reduction in vaccine efficacy over time from 80% to 40%. So we allow vaccine efficacy to reduce over time gradually uh, over a long period of time, over a, uh, a period of 500 days, and we allowed also uh, immunity, um, sorry, vaccine efficacy to, re to reduce suddenly over a very short period of time, within 20 days uh, or thereabout, and we compared the impact. So that's what I would call antigenic shift and antigenic drift. So the antigenic sh uh, shift, which is the huge uh, changes, will lead to you know, higher peak, whereas if the virus continue to undergo antigenic uh, drift, gradual changes, then you can see the, that, you know, cases will be much less compared to when the virus undergoes antigenic uh, drift. 
And for this is, has been seen to be true for some influenza viruses, that some influenza viruses that can undergo both shift and drift are more likely to cause to lead to pandemics compared to those on, that only undergo antigenic uh, drift. So we look, just looked at the, the, like I said, the results I presented earlier, we assume that boosters will continue to be given. Uh, the immune system, the population immunity will continue to be boosted over time continuously. But we now looked at what if we stop? What if we don't boost? So somewhere around um, March 2022, we assumed that we, we stopped boosting. And we, we looked at what will happen. So we can see that if there are no boosters, we, we see huge waves uh, of, of infection and multiple waves over time. And it takes a longer time before the, the disease becomes endemic. And the endemic level also is quite high. So these two are just the same scenarios that we present in the, in the last um, slide. This difference is just that there's no boosting. There's no boosting here. So, what that means is, is, is that since vaccine, um, vac vaccine induced immunity wins over time, then we need to boost uh, to, 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 con to control cases uh, over time. I will discuss, I will mention some of the caveats that, uh, that may, may uh, affect some of these results that are presented. <clears throat> So what we now went ahead to do, like I said earlier, was to solve that simpler model. And we got, the, we got a closed form solution for the endemic uh, states. And we now looked at how it depends on the reproduction number, vaccine efficacy, duration of immunity, and importation rates. And that is uh, what we've shown here. So the first one, we, we looked at how uh, the reproduction number, when the reproduction number changes with from two to, to, to five <clears throat> uh, for different uh, duration of immunity, immunity levels. So we have the red line for one year and the, the, the uh, green line for two years, then the blue line for four years. So you, you can see clearly that when you, immunity only lasts for a year, then you have the endemic states the incidence at, at endemic state will be will be high, and we we explored, you know, those the combination of all these parameters, and we see how they will affect uh, the, the incidence uh, at endemic at endemic mode. Results are presented per 100k. So the key message here is that to minimize prevalence at endemic city, what we need to do is to get um, to monitor uh, importation of cases and also to minimize R. Um, there, there are many ways we, 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 we can do that. Um, and also use high efficacious vaccines that has uh, potential for a, a long lasting immunity. So that's, that's where we are going to get the best, uh, the best combination of this will achieve the uh, very low incidence at endemic mode. So what this looks like, more or less like a, an optimistic scenario, we look at a more pessimistic scenario where we allow the production number to be much higher than uh, the picture that we present, present earlier. So, and we, we see that the reproduction number is high, very much higher and the duration of immunity is very short, then in the endemic mode, uh, the endemic incidence could be similar to current pandemic levels or even higher. So the, the assumption is that endemicity should be, or in the endemic mode should be lower than the pandemic mode and you know, lower, lower case counts and, and the likes. But this is showing that this is not always the case. So if you have, if you still have very high R values and the immunity is not lasting for long, the, the endemic mode can still see um, cases being quite, uh, quite high. 
So these are some of the uh, parameters that we use there that I described there, the vaccine efficacy, the production number, uh, duration of immunity, and the importation, importation rates. So just to dis dis discuss some of the uh, points that some of the results that I've, I've mentioned, we have seen that rapid reopening can lead to resurgence of cases. You know, even if vaccination coverage is about 90%, if we reopen rapidly, we can still see cases rebounding. So gradually lifting a restriction, instead of lifting, uh, lifting it uh, uh, rapidly, we can reduce peak infection by 60% and total cases by, by 10%. So the, when, we, when we explored the vaccination coverage uh, for different vaccination coverage levels for, for BC, we see that before Omicron, the high vaccination coverage in British Columbia is, all, is actually helping to keep cases under, under control. So vaccination is, is, is key. High effective vaccines with long lasting immunity coupled with uh, cross-border infection control will be very important uh, for, for any settings, um, either low vaccinated or high vaccinate, vaccinated settings. So <clears throat> these are important uh, things that we will keep in mind. So some of the caveats in the, in the model that some have mentioned earlier is that we mentioned we model transmission blocking efficacy. So we are not looked, looking at uh, the efficacy against uh, symptoms or against disease. We are just looking at if, if, if efficacy against infection. So what that, what that means is, is that when the efficacy, when even when people can transmit the virus or people can get infected in, uh, by, by the virus, it does not mean that they would necessarily get sick at the same rate. So one can, immunity can win, immunity from, from infection can win, whereas the, the, the person can still retain some immunity against infection, or uh, sorry, some immunity against hospitalization or, or symptomatic disease. We also assume constant ascentiamine rates over time, whereas in reality, uh, this might change. Uh, this often change, it depends on on the true prevalence, it depends on a lot of a number of things, test seeking behavior and, and the likes that will determine uh, the ascertainment rate over time. But for simplicity, we assumed that ascertainment rate is constant over time. So the other caveat is that in the model, we did not differentiate the protection that is gotten from uh, vaccination and that that is gotten from when someone recovers from infection. So we treated them the same rate, they win at the same rate. So some studies have shown that there could be some, some minor changes in, in the way immunity uh, from infection and that from vaccine um, function or react to over time. So the interesting thing to keep in mind is that, of course, our model is predicting large peaks and um, it's unlikely that infection will be allowed to grow uh, like that without, uh, without using some measures to curb it, as we have seen with Omicron, where cases are, are growing fast. And when public health officials see that the hospital capacity are being, uh, are being overrun or the capacity is, is almost, we are almost getting to the the, to the capacity, they kindly, uh, they quickly try to implement some measures. So the fact that we have these high peaks in the model does not mean that we will observe those high peaks in, in reality. That is on one hand. On the other hand, if, uh, if vaccines continue to protect against infection and cases are rising, but hospitalization are not rising, then uh, if hospitalization rate is not rising, then there could there might not be motivation to implement any public health measures uh, to curb rising cases. So we we can as well see uh, we can as well observe those very high peaks um, in in infection. 
So varied evolution and the nature of winning immunity are very important. And they will shape the relationship between infections and reported cases, uh, and also between infection and hospitalization. So if most, if the criteria for testing is symptoms-based, then most people who are vaccinated, even if they get infected and the vaccine is protecting against symptomatic infection, then they won't get tested because they won't even know that they are, they are, they are infected. So that will kind of affect the how, how, mo how much cases that will be, will be observed. So vaccine still remains one of the uh, stronger tools, the strongest tools that will shape the path of transition from the current pandemic to endemic mode. And what the modeling result has shown is that where there is high vaccine coverage and immunity la uh, and and uh, vaccine immunity is la long lasting, you could have lower um, lower endemic levels compared to where the, the vaccination coverage is not that high. So we, we may be looking at situations where when the disease become endemic, it could be we have low endemic levels in, in high vaccinated settings and higher um, endemic levels in low vaccinated uh, settings. But the fact that the, the fact, the point, the sorry, another factor that will play a key role is the population immunity due to previous infection. So a population may have low vaccination coverage, but high exposure. So that may kind of uh, account for uh, the low vaccination uh, coverage that they have. So these are um, more detailed. Um, there are a lot of uh, interesting details that, uh, that one can explore. So the fact that one has a high vaccination coverage does not necessarily mean that the endemic mode will be lower than where there's no high vaccination uh, coverage because immunity from previous infection will also be playing a role. The virus is expected to continue to undergo selection. So even if there's a high vaccination coverage in, in, in a particular jurisdiction, if cases uh, continue to rise in other places uncontrolled, then the chances for mutation, uh, the opportunity for mutations will be high there and the virus will be able to mutate and eventually spread globally as we've seen now for, for Omicron. So that is kind of pointing to a more holistic approach, a more global approach to, to responding to the pandemic. So the antigenic drift and shifts that we have explored here showed that antigenic shift is, is much more dangerous uh, than antigenic drift. <clears throat> and Omicron has shown that SARS-CoV-2 may actually have potential for antigenic, antigenic shift because of the uh, high number of mutations in Omicron compared to other previous, uh, previously identified uh, uh, variants. So <clears throat> and this, I think this is an important point that we may want to keep in mind going forward. So the transition to endemic mode could be marked by several waves of infection. So the, the common thing among public health officials or among the public would be that if we get to endemic mode, then cases will be lower, everything will be fine. Then once everyone is either vaccinated or, or exposed at some point, then the endemic, endemic point will be low. But the model is showing that uh, actually, even if you, you hit a, I would call it a transient, um, transient uh, herd immunity, you, cases can still continue to rebound and you have multiple waves over a long period of time before it eventually stabilizes uh, at endemic mode. And this can happen as late as January 2023 or even later. So the, the best way to reach the endemic mode without risking resurgence of cases would be to lift restrictions uh, gradually and measures should be taken to increase vaccine uptake uh, while improving genomic surveillance and monitoring of viral epidemiology and evolution. Of course, 
by doing this, we'll be able to detect what the kind of mutation that the virus is experiencing, uh, antigenic drift or shift. So it will help us to detect well on time the uh, evolutionary direction of, of, the, of the virus and to help us to be able to res respond more promptly. So I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, Professor Colin, uh, who I'm currently working with, and also Professor Tupa, who is also part of the group, and Dr. Stockdale, and um, Yeshuan Song, who is an MSc student in the group. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you so much for the great hands. So many hands up. <laughs> Thank you so much for the great presentation, um, Elisha. Uh, that was that was fantastic. I have questions, and I'm sure so many people have questions. But um, I'm going to keep the floor open before mine. So I first want to say thank you to Professor John Wu for joining us today. Thank you. And let us start with your question. Prof, you have a question? Oh, thank you, Jomi. I, I want to start with uh, a huge uh, thanks for organizing this, uh, this session. And I uh, want to thank Alicia for a fantastic uh, presentation and talk. And I want to make a remark about your four collaborators at the show and tell Professor Tupa that he never grew up, that the face always young and dynamic. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, and it's, you, you are with a very, very uh, wonderful uh, group down there. Um, I have a question about you mentioning of the transition to endemic uh, would have uh, probably a few waves and uh, uh, a best strategy is gradual reopening. And um, this I think is globally, but in, in terms of Canada, I just wondering really how much room we have really to, to gradually reopen it because the Canadian situation seems to be completely uh, modulated by the healthcare capacity. So, so the current way, for example, is not as uh, disastrous as it looks like. The only issue is we don't have the healthcare capacity. And before the pandemic, uh, the critical facilities, including ICUs, have always been maintained 80% of capacity. And so really a, a, a small community outbreak actually cluster will, especially with and, uh, the, the antigenic uh, drift and shift. And uh, if you don't want to take any risk, you would have to close the whole community again. So that's gradual opening. I just feel so um, uh, the room for reopening in the Canadian setting is so small. That's what I uh, just have you considered, say, the gradual opening to what a capacity and uh, how this is constrained by health facilities. I'm sorry, I missed a portion of your talk because I didn't know the meeting. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, that's an interesting take. I, I agree with you because I think the response here has been, um, of course, COVID has been affecting almost everywhere the same way, but the response here has been a bit different uh, from, from other places. Uh, so what, what, what I think is that if we, of course, currently we are under some level of lockdown, if this would be able to turn, turn down the, the cases, um, it's still yet to be seen. Uh, we, I think we'll see that in a couple of, of days or weeks to see if the, the current restrictions would be sufficient. Uh, modeling results says it, it, it wouldn't. Uh, so I, I think if we, we are able to control cases, whatever level of lockdown restrictions that we have. So currently we are kind of experimenting uh, looking at how things will happen. So if cases don't turn down and hospital, the hospital capacity is almost uh, full, 
then I'm sure stricter measures will be implemented. So, but if the hospital capacity is not full, probably because of vaccination and, and exposure, uh, we don't have much of a symptomatic illness uh, from the population, then I don't think there will be any, uh, any motivation to, to, to implement any restrictions because they will just look at the healthcare capacity. Do, can we, do we still have rooms? Do we still have beds at the hospital? Uh, if there are beds, then they, they can just allow cases to continue to, to, to go. So yeah, it's, I think it's, <laughs> that's my, my take on that. I, but I think um, the, the coming few weeks will be interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Prof, do you have more questions? No, I do have many questions, but I, I'm willing to, to wait uh, to give okay. other people opportunities. Okay, okay. Then yeah. I have I have many questions too, but <laughs> I'm sure we'll go to the so but um one one question I wanted to ask quickly is did you try to check if we if we go back to pre-pandemic level? they keep the boosting, then, um, then when the immunity, maybe six months, then keep boosting, then pre-pandemic level. Are we able to have a steady endemic state? Yeah, so yes and no. Yes, if, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, if we, we boost uh, quickly enough and the immunity lasts for long. So if immunity lasts for about three years and we boost, every six months or thereabout, then we, it can settle to endemic mode without having waves. Oh, immunity lasts for three years. Is that the um, vaccine induced or the natural immunity? So for this model, we are assuming that both are the same. Of course, in, in real life, it might be different, but we are assuming that the, if you, immunity from infection or from vaccination acts the same way in our model. That is in the model. In real life, I can go into the details of how these things may differ. So if, we, if, if immunity lasts for long, like I said, for more than two years or close to three years, and we boost, and R is not that high, this is, so it's, it's, it's a bit complicated. It's, it's a combination of a lot of things. So R not being high means that we don't have um, a new high, uh, high transmitting variants coming in you see, then things can settle. So what, any, if any of this goes wrong, then there will be a problem. So if they, there's an outbreak of a new variant, then you, you may see a spike because how number will jump up. Then, or, then, then I don't think immunity, like based on what we know currently, I don't think immunity will last for three years. Yeah, so the, so the, the detail there is that immunity against infection has been shown not to last for up to two years. So some people even say it lasts for about six months. That's against infection. Whereas immunity against hospitalization, um, I mean, immunity against severity, let me put it that way, lasts for longer. So that may, may last for maybe uh, more, than, um, more than a year or close to two years. So, so if immunity, even if when immunity wins, um, immunity against infection wins, and one still retains some immunity against hospitalization and um, symptomatic disease, then there will be a lot of cases, but there, there may not be any need to shut down the, the community because people are not, most people are not getting sick. Okay. okay, so I'm going to relax on my question and then Martin, you have a question? Yeah, I was just kind of wanting a bit more clarification on what you mean by the difference between antigenic drift and shift. Because like with flu, it's very specific. It's to do with the fact that flu has a segmented genome and there's that reassortment that can occur occasionally. What do you mean by with Omicron? Do you just mean a rapid selection for um, a certain mutations that say would be vaccine escape, that kind of thing? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. So like I said, it's just a term that we borrowed from influenza, the influenza world, <laughs> you see. And what that just means is that how, how much mutations are happening within a, within a short period of time. So if we have very little mutations over a, short period, over a long period of time, we call that antigenic uh, drift. 
But if we have a lot of mutations today, within a short period of time, we then will call that antigenic uh, shift. So yeah, it's yeah, it's just a term that we used. Okay, cool. I just wanted clarification. That's all. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Um, questions? More questions? Okay, Corinne, go ahead. Yeah, it was a very cool presentation. Um, so just even, I guess, with data collection efforts, just the point that you made. Now, if we're only testing serious cases, though, will it be extremely difficult then to get a measure essentially of that about, you know, is it really symptomatic cases that are going through? So how do we actually monitor it essentially going forward if we're only testing for serious cases to know the proportion that are infected that are serious versus those that are symptomatic, et cetera. And I know this is a policy right now in Ontario, but I know that BC is also having trouble with testing. Um, so they're limiting tests as well. So I guess for our models, how are we even gonna go forward and be able to monitor any of this? And I'm doing it too, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Corinne. That's an interesting point. You, you see, and it's it's kind of a night. I will call it one of the nightmares of modelers. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> ascertainment rates, um, how it changes over time with a lot of factors. I, I think it's it's really complicated. So, from my opinion, we need a denominator uh, to be able to compare how much case is the fraction of cases that are severe or not. And the denominator that we, we need is a kind of a population level uh, seroprevalence um, survey, you know, that will kind of tell us, okay, what is the pre prevalence uh, of the disease uh, currently? And we can do that over maybe three, three months period. It will give us an idea. So I'm just saying in an ideal world <laughs> where we have all the, all the all the things we need, then we can do population level sero, um, seroprevalence um, studies to to you know to I think it will help us to be able to tell the story better over time and to help us to know that okay out of this um, how many people have been admitted how many what are the fractions of those who are hospitalized and and the likes but I don't think we there's any motivation to do that now so. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I have a question from Corinne soon, but um, I will call on Professor Hu to ask this question first. No, I just want to respond to Karen's uh, questions. A very nice question raised uh, uh, the Ontario modeling table is meeting now, and science table is meeting now to discuss what should be done. My opinion is it's different. Um, Elisha, this is completely different from what you say. This is exactly the time we can do the model. Uh, um, see, because, because we don't have cases. But the cases we have, we had before is for us to, to calibrate and uh, parameterize the model, right? And, uh, and we have done that process. Our model have been calibrated, the parameters of baseline has been estimated, and we now know the when the Omicron become emerging and become dominant. So we know its relative transmissibility. Uh, and we also know the efficacy of one dose, two dose uh, vaccination against infections. So putting all this information, you should be able to project the actual number of infections, symptomatic and asymptomatic infections, right? So that's exactly what we need. The cases is really misleading. Even in the past, those are not the real uh, cases. They're only because in the past, because the surveillance is reliable. So from the number of cases to number of infections to the cases to a relatively stable ratio, right? And so what the model is really to project the number of infections, symptomatic, asymptomatic, you can still do that. And that will be the critical rule of modeling because that's why when the surveillance is, is kaput, your modeling can still provide the information that you need. So, mm -hmm. so in the past model is basically still telling the public health decision makers the data they already know. Now you're providing information mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't have it. 
right? So hybrid cases help you to validate uh, mm -hmm. a model. But without that, that would be the essential contribution modeling. So uh, I feel this is exactly the time. I mean, it is, I didn't see a model, but I know the, the Paris model by the uh, Carolines group. So that group project really the number of infections and the number of cases is a, is a derivative, right? So, so why you want to chase for the derivative? So you don't need- Can I ask a quick question? Cause I've seen yeah. like, and we've talked in our group, a lot of different estimates about vaccine efficacy when it comes to Omicron. So, yeah. and I think like everyone keeps saying, we're waiting for more data to figure that out. So are you saying that we doubt now have enough data that we can actually have an the accurate estimate? Ontario Science Table has a template online and uh, it's a very uh, depressing data. <laughs> the second dose offers literally zero protection against the infection. Really? I mean, I'm not talking about CV cases, right? So CV cases is derivative. And uh, when I'm talking about the, uh, because what the transmission model is really talking about infections. So the second does offer almost zero uh, uh, efficacy uh, uh, against infections actually is negative. Uh, and the negative, uh, you, there are lots of imp uh, explanations that, that could be um, the sources of misinformation in the future, in the near future. And actually, it's uh, the efficacy is, is not only minimal to almost zero, but actually sometimes it's zero or it's negative. Uh, negative could be become the behavioral changes because you, you feel falsely, you feel you're protective with two doses. And it could be biological reasons that would be very scary. Uh, uh, indeed, there are data now. We already have gone through a few weeks on Terra Heights data and uh, Jeffrey Kahn looking for name Jeffrey Kahn in the Pimper series. I don't have, I have the link. I cannot find it anymore. Uh, maybe I have. Uh, I think it, the paper is here. Just yeah. sent it. Right? Okay, good. I sent it to my group. So. Yeah, it's in the chat, Shin Hong. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So uh, yeah. anyway, so I'm sorry to, this is a controversial opinion. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Yeah, I've seen that. Uh, I read that paper that um, preprint, I think two days ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's scary. But it, I think what is interesting is that similar uh, studies from different places shows that, of course, the efficacy reduces uh, quickly but it's kind of different from this one. Not contrary, not contradictory really, but it's a bit diff um, it's diff yeah, different. Yeah, the scale is, is different. That's yeah, why the Ontario is, is yeah. science table is also, when they send this message, they say, well, this is very uh, depressing. Uh, okay, so that uh, brings me to my question. Uh, so um, Elisha, how did you adjust for under-reporting in your model? So we assume as a team fraction, um, like I said, we, we, so after we assume that not all cases are reported. So it's just a constant fraction that we, we assumed um, that, okay, maybe one out of five cases, only one out of five cases are reported. And we only, we now use that in our projection to say, Okay, if the true incidence is is ten, then you have to divide it by five to get the reported incidence. Okay, good, good, thanks, uh, Martin. It's just very quickly to go back to Corin's um, point about surveillance programs and stuff. But the, I mean, the, they'll probably. I mean, there have been surveillance programs like kind of carrying on in the background, which people have been using to model data sets from. Um, I mean, I volunteered in one myself and had to have blood taken every month. Um, they do exist. I mean, hopefully they'll continue afterwards. Just saying. Hmm. In terms of like just checking in the general infection status of people and their immune levels. I think people are also doing sewage um, waste thing. Also, I saw some, so I think I saw a paper on 
So they test the, the, the public sewage to kind of uh, detect the prevalence over time. Yeah. I don't know if anyone, any other person have seen those kind of studies. There was talk when I was still working for UK public health agencies that they were going to do some kind of monitoring system in care homes with regular testing. Good. So I think our time is up, but do we have uh, one last short question? <laughs> uh, so I have a question on herd immunity, but I think I can have in the chat okay. later. <laughs> so no question, anyone else? Okay. Um, just to make a quick point, um, Elisha, you're on the Slack channel for Next Generation, is that right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. So I think this is such an interesting presentation and lots of really important questions. So if you don't mind uh, just keeping an eye, we have, in fact, we have a, we have a thread on, um, you would have seen it on it and Demnesty. So I think if there's any questions, maybe if you want to just answer, that would be fantastic. And we can uh, make use of that platform because that would be great. Okay, okay, sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you yeah, for a great presentation. Uh, continue, uh, Dr. David. Yeah, thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much, Elisha, for coming. We really appreciate your time and your talk. It was a very timely one. Thank you Thanks. for coming. Okay. All right. So, and everyone will see you next week. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye.